Good evening. This lecture will be Leilui Nishmat Bechor Ben Tzipora and Rita Mazal Chaya Bat Ksia and Leilui Nishmat Fuad Efraim Ben Nisim Chai and Lehavdil Lerefuat Larisa Lea Bat Frida She has an important surgery tomorrow and also Shmuel Ben Lea also tomorrow uh, that you should have successful surgery with okay. Zatish. So there was the old side of the legendary Rabbi Avigdor Miller Zatzal, the Kohen, the biggest rabbi ever lived in America. And if you ask someone in our days, what's the highest level a human being can reach in this world? If you had to choose a person that did it, it was the one. The highest level. The Muna, the Dvekut, the perfect Midot, the endless knowledge of Torah, the devotion. And most important among everything is the perfect, accurate Jewish Ashkafa. The most accurate Ashkafa in the whole world he had. And I already, Baruch Hashem, hundreds of people wrote to me in the last three, four years since I started to promote his, his books to many people who didn't know about him all over the world. Even non-Jews are writing to me emails that I already wrote three, four of his books, Chovot al Vavot, or about the Parsha, things like that. I already changed their entire life completely. The way they look at life, their devotion, their level of religion. It's like people see miracles. A book that is written with such holiness. If a person take a pen and write Divrei Torah, there could be two rabbis that knows a lot of Torah, but one live 100% the way the Torah requires. In every moment of his life, meaning he is, a, he is a being that is actually being holy every second. When a person is so holy, he moves his knowledge and holiness combined into a book and makes a big impact on people. The other one that cannot, maybe is not holy, he has knowledge, but he himself is not holy, you see that his books will not be as effective. Will not be as effective. That's why sometimes you have a, you have in Israel some few holy rabbis that are very devoted to Hashem. Sometimes you can speak to people that are secular for a week, begging them to become Shomrei Shabbat, convince them, show them proofs, and they still hesitate. And uh, you take them to one of these big tzaddikim, like Rav Kook, Rav Ades, of Chaim Kanievsky Zatzal, people like that. And after five minutes conversation, okay, Rabbi, I will become, right away. Five minutes conversation, no proof, nothing. Just from the impact of such holy figure, they accept on themselves to change. And you ask yourself, wow, we work so hard to try to make him religious. And then the holy tzaddik spoke to him five minutes and immediately surrendered his Yetzer Hara. That's, that's what it is. Top. Ezrat Hashem, we were lucky that uh, his books were printed out on many of the shiurim and questions and answers and people send on the groups and they make those, uh, those weekly alonim, weekly booklets that they give all over in, uh, in English, should give more in Hebrew. They even have it in Yiddish, I believe. Baruch Hashem. Very good. Good for the generation that his knowledge and holiness will be spread. We are, as you can see, Baruch Hashem, we finished Passover, and now we are in the Omer, the days of the Omer. From the second night of Pesach, we're beginning the counting of the Omer, after the first day, which is Yom Tov. In Israel, it becomes right away Cholamued, because the Yom Tov is only one day. One day in the beginning, one day in the end. Here, in exile, it's two days and two days, because every Yom Tov is double. Besides Rosh Hashanah holiday, that it's two days all over the world, the rest of the holidays 
you know, are here two days in Israel one day. Besides Yom Kippur, that it's also one day here because of the fast, it's only one day. So from then, when they begin to count the Omer, it's actually Chol HaMoed. Here, when we start to count the Omer, it's still holiday, still Yom Tov, like Shabbat. Still don't drive, you know, still in Yom Tov. How many days we count? 49 nights, night and day, and then when the 50th day begins, that's the holiday of Shavuot. That's seven weeks before, between, Rosh Hash, between uh, Passover to, to Shavuot. The day, Chag, Chag Ma'amad Ar Sinai. Everyone call it Chag Matan Torah, which is not accurate, because the Torah was not accepted that day. But it's the Chag that we were standing in Mount Sinai and heard the voice of Hashem saying the first two commandments. Chag Ma'amad Ar Sinai. And that's, what, that's the day we became a nation. That's the day we heard the voice of God for the first and last time in history. So those 49 days, the Zohar, the Kabbalah says that every day we go one step higher. It's like you have 49 steps. And the goal is to reach to the 50th uh, step. And every night that we count, we go one step higher, 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 until we have the merit to accept the Torah. That's why it's very important not to miss a day, because if you miss a day, you can't count anymore with bracha. You cannot say the bracha after that. Because let's say uh, if you were on a seventh night, and then you forgot to count, and the following night is already the eight. You didn't count the seven, what are you going to say, eight? You skipped one day. If you forgot at night to count with the bracha, you still have all day tomorrow morning until sunset, all day to count, but without bracha. Because during the day we don't make bracha, only at night. So for instance, if someone forgot tonight to count, and he woke up tomorrow morning and he remember, he say, today is such and such to the Omer. Without bracha. What happened about tomorrow night? Continue with bracha. Since he count during the day, the day was not finished yet, he's still counting. That's it. Once he finished 24 hours without counting, finished. He cannot count anymore with bracha until the end. That's why we don't want to miss. Women that count, Sfaradim, they don't make bracha because it's mitzvah tase shazman grama. I believe the Ashkenazim, they, the women make brachot on mitzvot tase shazman grama, like lulav, sukkah, and all kinds of things that the, even though the woman is not obligated, since the nation of Israel is obligated and women are a part of it, they look at it as shvach to Hashem, praising Hashem, and women also make brachot. So what's the story of this Omer? We are in days of mourning. No music, no shaving, no haircut. It's day of, of Avlut. What happened? 24,000 very big rabbis, the student of Rabbi Akiva, had a pandemic. And in this month, between between Passover and Lagba Omer, the 34th day of the Omer, one day after Lagba Omer, they were dying. And uh, imagine hundreds of funerals every day, 800, 900 funerals every day. Imagine in a small place like Eretz Israel, you don't know to which funeral to go. This rabbi, that one, this one. What would you do? Today, with Hashem's mercy, if one of the biggest rabbis in the world passed, usually it's one per day. You don't have two or three passed in one day. Imagine Rav Uvadia, Rav Elyashiv, and Rav Kanievsky in one day. Where are you going to go? You have to run to Bnei Brak, then to Yerushalayim. It's going to be very difficult. Even with cars today, it will still be difficult. Imagine now you have 800 like this. Which rabbi should I go? He taught me when I was in second grade. He taught me when I was in seventh grade. He taught me when I was 20. He is my rabbi in the shul. This one is my Rosh Yeshiva. Who should I go to? Disaster. If you remember, once I explained that uh, a tragedy of the Jewish nation is not determined by quantity, like many ignorant think. It's only by quality. Every human being have a value on a scale in the eyes of God. 
In our eyes, we most of the time do not know to tell the difference between this person and we see two, two Hasidim, Yoeli and Nachman. They both look alike, beard, hat, pray in the same shul. We do not know how to evaluate them. Only Hashem knows which one of them is more righteous. Depend on his past life, depend on what he does in hidden rooms, depend on his ideology, depend on his difficulties, depend on many things. How much Torah he learns, how much devotion, how does he pray. There's thousands of thousands of things that Hashem evaluates. So only Hashem knows to put a rate on a person from zero to an endless number, everyone has a value. Jews and non-Jews. Even by non-Jews, they have different values. You take uh, the head of the Hamas. His value is negative billion. A very big Rasha murderer, killing murdered children. He knows that Israel belongs to the Jews. He reads it in the Quran, and he still go and shoot people on the street and kill them. So that's a monster. His value is minus billion. Then you have, on the other hand, righteous, righteous goyim. Love Israel, speaks very highly for the Jews, try to help Israel, try to defend Israel. We had few senators like this in Congress who actually try to help all the time the Jewish nation and the land of Israel. So they are more righteous Gentiles. Then you have in the Tanakh the Eov, Job, the prophet of the goyim. The prophet of the goyim. As a very holy man, a part of the Tanakh, it's his book, the book of Yov. Many Persian Jews call Ayub. Persian Jews called Ayub. Why? Since when a Jew calls his children after a non-Jew? If he's such a holy, righteous non-Jew, no problem at all. Shem loved him very much. You can see from the Tanakh. No problem, my children can be named after him. Also Persian Jews, many of them, their name is Koresh or Kurosh. Why they call themselves a name of a Goy? Because he was a righteous king. He gave permission to go build Bet HaMikdash, he gave the money. Cy Cy Cyrus, how they call him in English? Cyrus. In English they call him Cyrus. It actually reminds me that the son of, son of the Iranian Shah, right, that around 40 something years ago had to escape from Iran to Egypt when Khomeini, Machshimo came back to Iran. So the Shah and his entire family had to go to exile. The Shah went to Egypt, his wife went to France, his daughter went to Manhattan, his son went to Washington. Why the family had to go to, four, to different places? Because they knew those Muslim radicals, they want to kill them. Mm -hmm. So instead of killing all of us in one shot, it's better we're going to be in many places that if they kill one, at least the other ones will get saved. I don't have to tell you how hard it is. You live without your wife, without your children, everyone has to live with bodyguards and to hide, and they need security, always check what's in the car, what's underneath. You get a perfect example of Salman Rushdie. You saw Salman Rushdie, the author, he wrote a book, The Verses of the Devil, Psukea Satan, speaking about the Quran. For 25 years, I believe, Muslims were searching for him to kill him. They didn't forget. 25 years, not, not one Muslim forgot him. Until recently, about a year ago, he was in some rally, and someone spilled acid in his face, and made him, I think, deaf in one ear, or blind. Meaning they never leave you alone. You insulted our prophet, you insulted our religion. Even a thousand years later, we'll still search for you to kill you. The irony, the irony is that we, the Jewish people, the only nation that got the real book of God and the only real religion are not so zealous about people that insult our religion. We hear about it every day. We hear the lefty liberals, the communists, all kinds of antisemites just speak against the Torah. It bothers us, but five, ten minutes later we forget, we move on. They will never forget, and their religion is, has no connection to God. Zero connection. Complete fake. Just to show you, 
the things are happening around us and sometimes we're not paying attention. So the son of the Shah went to Israel for the first time today. I believe he's in his late 50s already with his wife and the respect that the Persian Jews gave him in Israel. I'm sure he's already considering to move to live in Israel, to leave America and move there. Like a king. Israel has uh, hundreds of thousands of Persian Jews. Many of them speak Farsi. They waited by his hotel, sang to him in Farsi, songs when they used to sing 50 years ago in Iran. You saw how excited he was. I, I know body language. I saw in his body language is in heaven. I don't think anyone gave him such respect since he, was, since he left Iran. He went to the Western Wall, put a yarmulke, prayed by the wall, and say that our grandfather Cyrus helped to build this place. I wish the lefty Jews will give 1% respect to the Western Wall like this guy gave. Irony. It's absurd what's happening around. But that's what's going on. Hoping, he's hoping that these Ayatollahs will go to hell soon and he'll be able to come back to Iran and get what's his. Because you know, kingdom moved to the sun automatically. Even in the Torah, David, son Shlomo took over. Has to be a son of a king. So if the father is a king, his son should take the kingdom. And I believe the grandfather was also the king. It's a few generations already. <coughs> so, when you think about politics, the only reason we are to today in a situation that we are with Iran is because of the Americans. Jimmy Carter and all their friends. They are the one who put the shard of commission because he raised the oil prices. He didn't want to bow down to them and surrender to them. So they brought Khomeini from and made a revolution. They also took Bin Laden to fight the Russian and he turned against himself. Killed 3,000 people in September 11. It's unbelievable how the American regime, everything they do, they fail. In Vietnam, they lost. In a war in Iraq, in the end, was all for nothing. Afghanistan, they escaped like mouse, mice, mice, escaped. Now we have the President Biden talking about weapon control when he left 300,000 guns, a gift to the Taliban, free of charge. Each gun, $1,500, $2,000, tanks, jeeps, planes, whatever they had over there. Billions of dollars of weapons they left. What you, what's going on here? You couldn't bring it back to America? People pay taxes here for this weapon. Why do you leave it for the Taliban? On purpose? I think it's more stupidity than uh, to leave it on purpose. What's the point of leaving your enemy the weapon? He agrees with them probably. I think he's on their side. He hates the Jews. And Everything makes sense. With him, everything makes sense. Anyway, Rabotai, so the Omer, 24,000 very holy people died. The reason, the official reason why they died, because they had issues between men to men. Life is divided to two categories, men to God and men to men. Women to women, you know the point. The point is, on Yom Kippur, you can repent for what you do wrong in front of Hashem. I told you to keep Shabbat, you didn't, you have to ask for forgiveness. I told you to put filin, you didn't, you have to ask for forgiveness. But what happened if you insult your friend? You had an argument and you insulted him. Yom Kippur doesn't help you. You can ask Hashem as much as you want, forgive me for insulting Moshe. I can't forgive you, it's not in my authority. The, to the rules that I put in my book demand that you go to that person and ask for his forgiveness. And until you get it, it will not be forgiven. So if he's an ordinary Jew, three times you apologize. By the third time, if he still refuses to forgive, Hashem will understand that and will not punish you. After all, you ask for forgiveness for three times. But if he's someone who knows Torah, teach Torah, live according to the Torah, what we call today rabbis, someone like this, a Talmud Chacham, 
if you insulted him, if you wrote against him in the internet, if you spoke in public against him, you wrote something against him in a book, and now you, have to, you finally realize you made a big mistake and you come to apologize. If he refused to forgive you, even a thousand times you came and begged, thousand times, every week you come, next week, next week, next week, next week, already 10 years. No, I don't forgive you. You still lost your Olam Abba. Your world to come is in his hand. Nothing will help you. Nothing. Why? Because once you go up to the court of heaven, you're going to have this pending violation. That you insulted the Talmud Chacham in public, you ruined his character, his uh, reputation, whatever you want to call it. And as a result of that, he never forgave you. There's nothing you can do about it. Now you have a very big problem. Usually, if Hashem likes the person and he sees that he's sincere and he really wants to repent, right? Usually, Hashem will soften the heart of this Talmud Chacham to forgive. Hashem doesn't want a good, righteous person who really repented to lose his share to the world to come for something he did 10 years ago. When in the meantime, he became a lot better than what he used to be. Hashem is, uh, you know, is logical, but the way things work, sometimes you don't even know where to find the Chacham. What happened if he passed away? You insulted the Chacham, and you now, after five years, want to go and apologize. You came, and you found out he passed away. You have to go to his grave with ten people, declare what you did wrong to him. Sometimes it's very embarrassing, but it has to be done. And you have to f ask him for forgiveness in front of the ten men, together with ten people. And after that, you have to hope that Be'ezrat Hashem, everything was erased. Sometimes the damage is not only to that Chacham, it's also to his family. His son, they can't get married because of what you say. You ruin the reputation of the whole family. You have a problem with other people, not just him. Bottom line, better to be very careful not to hurt people, especially righteous ones. Wicked people, it's no problem. Atheists, what we call apikorsim, reshaim, what's called rasha according to the Torah, there's no problem. Mitzvah to put them down, you can talk Lashon Ara about them, they mechalele Shabbat, they kofrim Hashem, they fight the religion. Someone like Bernie Sanders. If you spoke Lashon Ara about him, you'll get a reward for it. Yes. Those idol worshippers, not only are allowed to speak Lashon Ara about them, you also, it's mitzvah to make fun at them. And to make fun at their idols. That's why sometimes I use the expression J.C. Penny, what makes the liberal Jews very upset. <laughs> More than the Christians. Why you call him J.C. Penny? It's not, it's not right. Why you call Biden Sleepy Joe? It's not right. <laughs> Why you call uh, Santa Claus Santa Claus? <laughs> Santa Claus is promoting rebellions against God. Oh, that reminds me that someone sent me today a little clip of uh, Rosh Shivat Or Sameach. Can't really pronounce his last name. It's a little bit hard for me. But anyone knows his last name? In Israel. In Israel. Berkovsky, Berovsky, I can't really pronounce it, it's a little complicated. So someone asked him, one of the students of Santa, they asked him if uh, my claims against him, that he wrote a book, God Needs Us, if my claims are solid or not. So he's answering over there, you know, he has trying to be diplomatic and saying that, you know, well, after all, God made us, you know, so by him wanting to benefit us, it's also, you can say that it's a need. It's not the need, the way we think that God is incomplete, but even when you want to benefit someone, after all, you needed that someone, right? But that's called, the person that asked the question is a clever manipulator, or a liar, whatever you want to call him. 
he manipulated the rabbi. Obviously, the rabbi didn't read that junk. He hear a question, but he doesn't know the main part of the book. The book doesn't just say, I, God needs us, and he created us because he needs us. That wasn't the main thing over there. Because God needs us and he made us and we didn't ask to come to the world, meaning he had no right to make us, he cannot tell us what to do and he has no right to punish us. He has to apologize to us that we are here. We don't have to apologize to him. We owe him nothing. That's the main part of the book. That part he didn't tell the Rosh Hashiva Tor Sameach. If Rosh Hashiva Tor Sameach would read his junk, I hope he won't do it because I'm afraid for his health. What can happen to him? Chaval, Talmid Chacham. If he will survive the tragedy of reading that book, definitely will make a permanent damage to his, to his brain. We have to pray for Rav Ephraim Kachlon that had to spend seven hours of his time to read his junk because he had to make a video to prove that it's all heresy. So he had to analyze all the heresy in the book. He made an amazing video. Thank to, thanks to him, many curious people didn't have to waste 10 hours of their time to read this kfira. They made it in Hebrew. I want to tell you something. What is the most wicked newspaper in America? Libra, lefty, anti-religion, anti-God, anti... Republican, which one? Times. New York Times. There is a newspaper in Israel that is about a hundred times worse than New York Times. You know what's the name of it? Huh? Ah, it's nobody reads besides few lefties. <laughs> newspaper that everybody reads. Idiot Achronot. Idiot Achronot. This newspaper. On, on, on a website, they call themselves Ynet on the internet. This newspaper is allergic to God, super allergic to rabbis, very big fan of lefties and traders and everything you can think of. And they also have publications of books. From all the publications in Israel, there are thousands of them that publish holy books. Rambam, Ramchal, all these books. Rabbis of our generation. Everyone publishes book in a kosher place. Guess where he printed his book, by which publication? Yediot Achronot. Do you understand why they were so happy to publish his book? What they've been dreaming finally came with someone that looks like a religious person. Do you understand? Imagine if tomorrow Bernie Sanders wants to publish my book by hundreds of thousands of copies, and he pays for it. Everyone who ever liked me or I influence him will not be able to look at me after that. If Bernie Sanders support and endorse the rabbi so highly, probably the rabbi became also Santa. <laughs> right or wrong? 100%. You need me to tell you this. All you have to do is one plus one. That's it. However, there are so many fools out there that still waste time on his garbage. And the sad part, really I'm sincerely saying, the sad part is that they will go in the next world to where he goes. And it's going to be very painful for a very, very long time. Mark my word. That's what's going to happen to all these heretics. Some of them, they don't support what he said. They know it's heresy. But they're still curious to hear. That's also a sin. If I'm curious to see what the, what the, 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 the priest in a church is teaching, I have permission to go to his speech? Not allowed. If you argue with wicked people, or the Christian missionaries hunting Jewish innocent people and turn them into Christians, someone has to learn their garbage and to be able to argue with them. Nobody likes to do it, but people like Rabbi Tuvia Singer, 
Unfortunately, myself and some others needed to learn their nonsense to be able to save Jews from falling into their hands. But an ordinary Jew that is not giving speeches or writing books or does not have any mission to go and save Jews that became Christian, what reason he have to read one line in a book of heresy of idol worshiping religion? Or any religion. Islam is not an idol worship religion. But still, but still, it's not the book of God. Why are you reading over there? Oh, Rabbi, I saw some things there that make sense. Of course, they copy it from the Torah. You should not steal, the Quran say. <laughs> Very nice. You need to be religious to know you should not steal. It also says you should not kill. It also says you should not kill. They also say that the Torah is a divine book, 100%, the book of God. And over there it says you should not murder people. As we speak, you know in France, 16% of the populations are Muslim now. The president of France passed a law around the Congress there. The president in France can be above the, the Congress of the French. You know, so he can, he can circumvent their decision. They decide no, he said, I decide yes. Like a veto. In America, it's similar, but over there is more powerful. He decided to pass a law against their opinion that pension will go from 62 to 64. You want the government to pay you lifetime pension? It will be from now on two more years of work. It's not, it's not a big deal. It's a very big deal. Think about it. You're 61, and you're counting in 12 months, I'm finally going to go fishing and eat frogs. You know, they love, the French, they love to eat frogs. They catch the frogs with a net, like this. They cook them, and they eat them. So imagine now he's already thinking, soon I'm going to go fishing, and all of a sudden, they hear they have to work two more years. Delivering mail, working for the government. So they get, they went crazy. So France is burning. Every few months, they burn France, and all the hooligans join the wagon. Even people who don't care, the twenty. What do you care about the pension now? By the time you be in pension, I don't think there will be France, bichlal. <laughs> what do you worry? There's a party, violence. They love violence. Why the president of France decided to raise the age? Very simple. They broke. Europe is bankrupt. It's, on, it's basically bankrupt. The Russian gas, the war in Ukraine, inflation, all kinds of problems in the world destroyed Europe financially. So the government, if they're going to have to pay so many millions of French old people, monthly salary, two more years, it's going to be hundreds of billions. He's trying to save money to the government, not to go bankrupt. And there's another reason. People live longer now. When the law was made 62, people live to seven years old. 70 today is a teenager. <laughs> Remember my Syrian friend? When I used to say, wow, well, once you become 70, you get old, say, you, you bury, you're upsetting me. I look to you old, I'm 72, I still play tennis. <laughs> Can you say 80? <laughs> now it's 80, that was uh, 10 years ago, it's 82 now. If I say 80, he will still tell me, hey, I'm still playing tennis. <laughs> Bottom line, today the age of average age is around 80. 77, 70. Back then, when they made the law 62, the government said, anyway, anyone die in six years, seven years, eight years. So it's no big deal. Now they have to pay extra 10 years. They try to shave some of that money. Social security. Here in America, you pay social security. There's no guarantee that by the time the teenager will become old, they will ever get their social security. The government can pass a law, we're bankrupt. We don't have money to give you. 
We'll give you just bread to live, that's it. Bread and cucumbers. Not to starve. Can't give you a salary. There's no guarantee. We, Baruch Hashem, we don't count on the government and we don't count on the insurance companies. We only know Hashem runs the world and He decides who eats and who doesn't eat and who starves. It's all in the end of Hashem. Hashem decides. Today you walk on the street, if Hashem wants you in jail, tomorrow you'll be in jail. There's one tzaddik in Monsi, very nice guy, very nice guy. You see, good person. He drives a taxi to the airport, take people down to earth. Ashkenazi, Nechmad, very nice person. He drove the other day, Erev Pesach. Erev Pesach, few hours before Lela Seder. He drove the car in Monsi. Police woman was following him. She decided he made some kind of a violation. You know, wee, wee, wee. So he went into parking lot of a mall and she went after him and he got nervous. You know how you look for the registration, this, that, you get nervous, especially this guy which is very soft character. He got very nervous. While he's looking for the paper, he didn't realize that she quickly came out of the car. So he wanted to move the car, so he turned the car all the way to the left and started to go into the parking. And she was close to the car. He didn't run her over or anything. So she arrested him, riding on a report that he tried to kill her. <laughs> tried to run her over. Do you know what it is? Something like this, out of nothing, a cruel and to send my judge, that see a religious person like this, can give him 20 years in prison. Attempted murder. For nothing! Just to show you how quick your life can be over. Look what they did to Rubashkin. He made some things. He should, all the experts say he should have got four or five years in prison. They gave him 30 something years. Huh? Less. less, even less. I'm uh, being generous, I say four or five years. Everybody else who did what he did, maximum get four years after good behavior, he comes out in three years and that's the end of it. So what did they give him? 30 something years to make sure he would live in jail for, for, for the rest of his life. That by the time he was supposed to come out, he would be 85 or something. That was obvious, and a, a murder of a judge. He hates a Jew, let's put him for life in prison. Why not? There are no other reason. 100 judges and lawyers wrote that it's outrageous. It's not fair, there's no justice here. They wrote the article. He was seven years in prison, nobody cared. Thanks to President Trump, he released him. If not Trump, he will be in prison another 20 something years by now. Oh, Hashem, he got his life back. And guess what? They don't let him enter England. Maybe he can become my chevruta. <laughs> he wanted to go speak in high school in England. The liberal, rubbish government of England who let Hamas terrorists and Hezbollah mass murderers entering in and out every hour by thousands. Biggest terrorist in the world living in London, in all those places, all over Europe. They come in and out, even though the YouTube is full of their hate speeches kill Germans, kill French, kill Americans, kill British, kill Jews. In and out, with admiration by the liberals. A righteous religious Chabadnik who hired people illegally, no? Sander, it's not right, but come on, it's a murderer, he's a terrorist. He did some things, you know, white collar crimes, like they say. Almost every person in the world is a white collar criminal. Do you know how many times you violate the regulations of your credit card? If you only know, if you read all the words that they write over there, you're not allowed to breed. If you let someone else use your card and give you cash, it's already a violation. According to the contract, it's a federal crime. Do you know that the IRS have one provision in the contract, in their laws, that if you made money from an illegal activity, such as stealing, 
robberies, selling drugs, etc., you must report it on your tax return and pay taxes on it. <laughs> no way. Huh? Yeah, no way, really. No way? Today, today someone sent me a picture with the IRS logo. That's one of their laws. If you sell drugs, we'll put you in jail for 30 years. But we still want our share from the crime. <laughs> in Israel, they made a comedy. Listen to this. Unbelievable. One guy walked with his uh, briefcase on the street, man in his late 60s, and one guy wants to rob him. Pretends he's on his phone, standing by the street. Just when this older person passed by, pulls a gun, hey, it's a robbery. Calm down, calm down, no need to panic. Robbery, robbery. Israeli humor, you know. Takes off his wallet. How much you got there? 700 shekel. Give me the money. No problem, calm down, here's the money. The guy is about to leave, say, wait, what about paying taxes on the money? The guy asks him. So what? So by law you have to declare taxes. Do you want to get into trouble with the law? Or well, you want to sit years in prison for that? The robbery is nothing. Now you have to pay taxes. How much? 48%. And if I pay 48%, I'm okay? Yes. I happen to be a collector of tax. I work for the Israeli government. So if you declare on your tax return, you'll be fine. Robbery, 700 shekel, for, for the, how much is that? He calculate, he gives them 48%, which is almost 350 shekel. Oh, wait a minute. Are you an independent or are you an employee? I work by myself, self-employed. Oh, so you have to declare tax, 17%. Here it's 8.5%, sales tax in Israel, 17%. You have to pay 17%, how much? So he gave him another few hundred shekel. Then, what about social security? <laughs> and he gave him all the requirements. The guy left with zero money. Said, but now, admit, doesn't it feel great to be a loyal citizen and pay all your obligations? <laughs> it's a joke, comedy, but every comedy has some truth in it sometimes, you know. So they, they, they want you to work for them, and then they take the money and send it to Zelensky and to the Nazis over there, and Zelensky and his buddy put $400 million in their private account, like they published yesterday. So Americans gonna kill themselves over here, calculate every dollar to survive, paying 30, 40% of the money, and in the end, uh, the fool who doesn't remember his name will approve another three billion budget to Ukraine. What do we have with Ukraine? That's the world we live in. You know, I once told you a story that the one person walked into the shul and he saw on a parochet, it's written, Leilui Nishmat Rav Shmuel Satan. For the memory and the elevation of the soul of Rabbi Shmuel Satan. What kind of a Jew? His last name is Satan. Right away, he ran to the rabbi. Rabbi, who was Rabbi Shmuel Satan? What kind of a Jew has such a name? Ah, you don't know the story? Long, long time ago, there was a big tzaddik, Rabbi Shmuel Alevi. No, how he became Satan. One time he walked in the street and he found a wallet. And when he checked inside, there was an ID there, and the ID belongs to the prince, the son of the king. Immediately he ran to the palace. The guards were standing there. I have to return the wallet of the prince. So give it to us, we'll give it to him. He didn't trust them. No, I have to hand it to him, to his hand. Okay, let, let's find out. They went upstairs, let him in, without an appointment. He walked in, the king and his son are sitting in the office. I came to return your wallet. The king said to the son, count, make sure everything is there. Maybe this Jew stole something. He count, he said, no, everything is here. The king said, we appreciate very much. Let me pay you for your efforts. What would you like? Do you need anything? 
the Jew said, no, I made a mitzvah, return a lost object. I don't want anything in return. No, no, you're insulting us. People would say that I did not pay you back. It's not good for my reputation. I have to make it up to you somehow. Find a way. No, I did it for Hashem. I don't want from you anything. Okay, I see you stubborn. Let me give you a note with my stamp. If one day you'll have a problem, I owe you a favor. We'll keep it in the record. So he took the car, he left. A year or two later, the country went into a war. They're running out of money. One of the priests over there said to the king, listen, the Jews make a lot of money. They're very successful. Raise their taxes from 33% to 80% until the war would end. Wars could take years then. 80% tax. They're going to work like a slave. Only 20% you take, 80% you give. Ah, oh, everyone was panicking. It's not worth to keep the business. One person remembered that the king owed a favor to Rav Shmuel Alevi. They came to him, save us, go back to the king, you have the note. No, I don't want to get a reward for it in this world. No, you have no choice. It's not you anymore. It's the whole community. The rabbi said, yeah, they're right, you have to go. He went back to the palace. It was three minutes to four. 4 p.m. He's trying to get in. He showed them the note. They asked the king. The king is on the way out. He's putting his coat. He's about to leave the office. He said to him, you remember me, your majesty? I came here a year, two years ago. I returned the wallet to your son. Oh, yeah, yeah. I came to discuss the note. So, uh, it's already one minute to four. I'm sorry, four o'clock, I have to go. I'm in a rush. The king, the, the Jews said to the king, it's not going to take that long. So the king said to him, if, if you can say your problems in four words, say it. If not, come back next Wednesday. This was a very clever chacham. He said to him, okay. Vayomer Hashem el satan And God said to the Satan, Vayomer Hashem el satan Four words. The king got curious. What did God say to the Satan? Continue. So, mm -hmm. Four words. Mm. Go ahead, go ahead. Hashem was upset at the Satan. He told him, why you have done it this way? You should have done it this way. While he's telling him the story about the Satan, he got into the tax issue. You destroy us. We're not going to work. What is, what's good is this for you? No, everyone closed their business. No one wants to work for 80% tax. The king said, okay, I tell you what. I owe you a favor. Favor is a favor. And I you have it in writing. I'm willing to cancel the tax and bring it back to what it was in only one condition. Since you fooled me with the Satan, your last name from now on will be Satan. You agree? He said, of course. So remember, if one person will call you Levi, I put the tax right back and I owe you nothing. Deal, fair deal. I'm going to put detectives in your shul. Fair deal. So they made a gathering. Everybody has to remember. If you call Rabbi Shmuel one more time, Levi, we all become bankrupt. So everyone was so nervous. Who wants to lose all their wealth? So everyone practiced. Satan, 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 Satan. So much until a few years later he died. Nobody even remembered that his last name was Levi. They wrote on a parochet, Leilui Nishmat Rav Shmuel Satan. How much a person is willing to suffer to save others? To save others. On Shabbat, that was just the introduction. But before we get to, to start the lecture, just one thing I didn't finish. So 24,000 Chachamim, the student of Rabbi Akiva, they all passed within the period between Passover and Lag Baomer. Lag Baomer 
is the yard side of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the writer of the Zohar, the Kabbalah. Uh, from the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, only five left. And from those five, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was one of them, from those five, they restarted the entire oral Torah again, because those five knew everything, and they started to teach and teach and teach and bring it back to date. Because 24, the biggest Rachachamim, they all died. And why they died? Because they did not give enough respect to, it, to each other. Now I want to ask you, if somebody asks you, what is the biggest tragedy of the Jewish people in a history. The biggest tragedy. Right away, 99.9% .9 of the Jews would say immediately, without even thinking, the Holocaust. Millions of people died. It never happened before. We had a lot of pogroms, and we had the destruction of the first temple and the second temple, and many other problems, and exiles, and a lot of problems. But millions to die like this every day, thousands of thousands dying for a few years, it's obviously a very big tragedy. Mitzrayim. They don't even know about Mitzrayim. You ask people in the world, how many secular Jews in the world knows that 80% of the Jews died in the darkness in, in Mitzrayim? How many? So only religious people know it. Even not most religious people don't even know it. The Gemara says, Hamushim Yatsu Bnei Israel in Mitzrayim, one out of five. Meaning 12 million died in Mitzrayim. But I can say that maybe it wasn't, wasn't officially the nation of Israel, because Judaism only started in Matan Torah. Okay, you can say that. Oh, anyway, right away they would say the Holocaust. Today in Israel was the Holocaust Day. Very sad day, everywhere, ceremonies. But, in the, eyes, in the eyes of regular, ordinary people, we count the deaths by quantity. When you hear there was a terror attack, the first thing comes to your mind, I hope not that many people died. So if you hear one or two or three, you have a relief. Wow, Baruch Hashem, it's not 20, 30, 50, 70, 100, 200, you know, that we saw terror attacks with mass casualties. If no one dies, wow, it's a very good. Why? Because you count it by quantity. But for instance, the two little cute kids of the Palais family, one I think was six, the other one is eight, religious kids from Talmud Torah with no sins in the record. They're very pure, all their life from zero. They only know Torah and yeshiva. They don't commit sins grew up to be religious kids and adults, and then both of them died. Each one of them can be equal to a thousand other people on the scale, spiritually. The Gemara says that the Chachamim were speaking about the level of the Torah of the pure children, Tinokot Shel Bet Rabban. So the Chachamim say, but we also give our life for the Torah. We learn Torah all our life. Why they are better than us? And the answer of the Gemara is, Torah with sins is not equal to Torah without sins. And these kids up to Bar Mitzvah are totally pure. No stains goes on their soul. It's pure soul. Therefore, the Torah goes into a pure vessel is a lot more important than the Torah who goes into someone that also have negative going in. It's not the same. So Tinokot Shel Betra, that's why Mordechai closed all the yeshivot in Persia back then, and everyone went to the city of Shushan, fasting for three days, all the children, why? That what can save us from Holocaust. The prayers and the Torah of these children that all gather together, why? It's pikuach nefesh. So what, what happened over here? When chas v'shalom, two, three, five thousand people are supposed to die because the Satan is pushing and pushing and pushing, Hashem doesn't want to take five thousand people in Tel Aviv now. 
He rather they get full life that they have enough time to do tshuva. And if they won't, at least they won't have any claims. If they die in their 20s, they're going to say, oh, it's not fair. I still could have lived another 50 years. By then I would become religious. Before I even realized what's going on, I just came out of the army and two years later you killed me. So Hashem knows. So what does he do? Instead of taking 5,000 people, he will take five kids, like the Sassoon family. Seven kids who got burned on Shabbat. In my opinion, could have been 100,000 people that could have died. And they went as a sacrifice, of course, expressed to heaven, but they saved us. They saved us, they saved me, they saved you, her. Every one of us was a potential person to live. By their death, they gave us life. Just like Leavdil, many of the soldiers in Israel who go to combat and die to protect the land, by they sacrificing their life, they gave us life. Or some of them watch the areas where the yeshivot are close to the Arab. The people that sit and learn Torah all day, they have a peace of mind to learn, knowing there's a lot of soldiers there in a, in a gate of the place. Without it, they would have to live with paranoia there. <laughs> so, the answer to this question, what was the biggest tragedy in the Jewish nation? The death of the 24,000 of the student of Rabbi Akiva. That's the answer. That was the biggest tragedy that we ever had from the day Hashem created the world until now. Because every one of them can be equal to tens of thousands of rabbis of today. Tens of thousands, each one of them. The Gemara says, "Katan shebaim mechayem metim." The Gemara gives an example of the 80 students of Hillel Azaken. Hillel Azaken was the president of Israel. You know, Hillel, he was very poor. He was climbing on the roof of the of the shul, put his uh, his face in a chimney there, not to miss the day of Torah. He was chopping trees. Back then, it cost money to go to learn Torah. Not like today we beg people to come and pay the money to learn. Back then, you want to enter, you have to pay. And Hillel didn't have money, so he used to chop trees, and with the trees, they warm the place. In Tzfat, in the Galilee, it's very cold in the winter. He give them trees, they burn the trees, and that's how he can go in. One day, it was a snowstorm. There's no way to chop trees, they don't let him in. They say to him, I'm sorry, I'm only working here. Everybody must pay to get in. Give me some credit. I'll try to give you more in the next few days. I'm sorry. You don't pay, you don't go in. So what did he do? He climbed on the roof, put his face in the chimney to listen to the shiur. Who used to teach? Two converts. Shmaya and Naftalion. Two ex-goim who became huge rabbis. Imagine this. Two former Gentiles became the two biggest rabbis of the generation. So Hillel, which will be the president of Israel, is their student of the two converts. No discrimination. A, can, a goy can reach the highest level in the world, convert, become a big chacham, and in the end become the, the most important person in the world. Like Itro. Itro. It's father-in-law of Moshe Rabbeinu, one of the most important people is Itro. Parasha in the Torah is named after him. Rachav, the former prostitute, became the, the Rebetzin, the chief Rebetzin, the wife of the chief rabbi of the world, Yoshua Benun, who let us enter Israel and occupy the land. Yoshua Benun, the student of Moshe Rabbeinu. No discrimination. Hillel had 80 students. The greatest one, Yonatan ben Uziel. You have in the Torah, Targum Yonatan. Translate the Torah. He was the biggest one. The smallest one was Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai, who also was the president of Israel. From the 80 student, he was the last one on the list. 79 were greater than him. The smallest one of Hillel was the president of the whole nation of Israel. And the Gemara begin to describe his knowledge. 
He knew the language of the animals. The birds are singing in the morning. He knows exactly what they talk to each other. The roosters, the lions, the elephants, all the noises in the jungle, it will tell you what the conversation is about. The language of the trees, the language of the angels, things that King Solomon taught a thousand years before his time, everything he knew. Rabbi Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. He was the president in the time of the destruction of the second temple when the Romans destroyed the temple. Thanks to him, they did not kill the family of Rabban Gamliel, which is the family of Mashiach. So we still have a chance to have Mashiach. They didn't kill Sanhedrin that moved to Yavne. All the Chachamim, 71 biggest Chachamim. He convinced them not to kill them. And they cure Rabbi Tzadok. There was one tzaddik, Rabbi Tzadok, that he fasted for three years. He doesn't eat. The Arabs have Ramadan 40 days from morning to evening. Three years he only drink, doesn't eat. His stomach, the Gemara said, became like a piece of paper. He, now if he wants to eat, he can eat. He will choke, he will get sick. Stomach cannot accept any food after three years. They asked the Romans, please cure Rabbi Tzadok. Thanks to him, for three years, the Roman could not break the walls of Jerusalem because he was fasting for three years and praying to Hashem with tears. So the Romans started to give him all kinds of soft food, little by little, and they gave him life back. This is Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. So imagine him. Multiply him by 24,000. 24,000 rabbis like this died in one month. Each one of them on a scale can be equal to 100,000 Jews today. American Jews, Israeli Jews, European Jews, doesn't matter. Because Hashem rate the people only based on their actions and the level of their holiness. How holy you are. How modest you are. How much Torah you learn, how you pray, how much chesed you do, kindness, how much donations you give, how many souls you save, how much you have a love for the rest of the nation of Israel, how great is your personality and your traits. So every person has a, raid, a rating in Shemaim, which only Hashem knows. We can only assume we see someone like Ravel Yashiv. We already know he's, he's for sure in the top of the list. But can we swear that was the biggest in the world? That's only Hashem knows. We have Rav Chaim Kanievsky, we have the Stipler, we have the Chazonish, we have Rav Ovadia, we have Rav Ben Zion, Abba Shaul, Rav Wozner, and many others. Who is the biggest? Only Hashem knows. Even though we know Chazonish was uh, something unheard of, but Maybe someone who lived 40 years after the Chazonish, like Rav Chaim Kanievsky, maybe in the eyes of Hashem is higher, we don't know. Because Hashem knows the generation, the environment, you know. One thing for sure it is that those holy people, every one of them equal to many, many thousands. So the tragedies do not go by bodies. The tragedy goes by how much the nation of Israel is losing. And I can give you a proof from the Gemara. The Gemara say when the righteous people are asleep, it's bad for them and bad for the world. They're damaging the world by sleeping. Why? Because where, when they are awake, they bring a lot of good things to the world. By what they do, learn Torah, teach Torah, do good things. So when they go to sleep, the world is losing. When the wicked people sleep, good for them and good for the world. Like if you remember Rabbi Ovadia Yosef was so furious at Ariel Sharon. Remember when he gave the whole Gush Katif to the Hamas terrorist close to Gaza over there? Gave them a whole city, farms, dozens of synagogues. Hundreds of private homes and buildings in return for nothing. Nothing. The Arabs did not commit to anything. 
Here, take it. They took Jews out of their homes by force, threw them like garbage, pressed charges against seven thousands of them. Some of them even went to jail for refusing to evacuate their homes. Some of them until today do not have a place to live, more than 20 years later. Avovadia was so furious at this trader, he cursed him. But a very interesting curse. He didn't say he should drop dead. <laughs> he didn't say that. He said he should sleep and not wake up. Those were his words. Hashem will give him a bana, a punch. He will fall asleep and not wake up. A few days later, he got co a coma. Something in his brain exploded. Seven years, he was sleeping in bed. And when did he die? A month after Rav Ovadia passed. Seven years. Rav Ovadia was 86 when he said he should sleep and not wake up. And Rav Ovadia passed at 93, and a month later Sharon died. And in the end, Sharon wasn't even Jewish. On top of everything. His mother wasn't Jewish. Vera, from Russia. Vera. His father brought Vera Goya to Israel. She went to some reform faker, gave her a little piece of paper, and that was the end of it. This is what's going on. So now we are in the days of the Omer, we don't shave, I know it's itching, we suffer, the food, the oil. It's not easy for those who are not used to it. But it is what it is. We gotta give respect to all these giants who passed. No haircuts, no music. Some places they allow them to put music, just melodies, you know, like restaurant, doctor's office, you know, places like this. Radio station. Whatever they have to, they want to do, they have to ask the Chachamim what to do, what not to do. Some Ashkenazim begin the morning after Rosh Chodesh Yar. Because we have a rule that in the month of Nisan you don't have mornings. There's no eulogies. When, you, when there's a funeral, you don't say eulogies. The month of Nisan, there's no confessions when we pray. It's a happy month. So the, some of the Ashkenazim say, we cannot mourn in a month that you're not allowed to even do confessions, in the Filat Apayim. So they start in Rosh Chodesh <coughs> That was one of the claims that the rabbis back then were had against Ben-Gurion and his friends when they decided to make the Holocaust day in the month of Nisan, which was today. Chaf Gimel Ben Nisan. Why do you make a day of mourning Dafke Ben Nisan? It's not supposed to be a day of mourning in Nisan. I wonder if Ben-Gurion was smart enough to answer, you mourn the Omer, no? So what's the difference, the Holocaust or the Omer? That was a Holocaust, and that was a Holocaust. Probably didn't know about it. On Shabbat, Rabotai, we read Parashat Shmini. Still in the book of Vaikra, Leviticus. Parashat Shmini, we're going to learn something very interesting about the power of a person that pray. It's written in a pasuk, Vaisa Aaron et yadav el am. Vayivarchem, vayered me'asot achatat. Aaron is doing Birkat Kohanim. When he finished, he went down after he finished to sacrifice the chatat and all that. Top. The, the way of the, the Yetzer Hara, when he see a Jew is excited to do a mitzvah. Let's say now you came to the synagogue, you're very inspired to pray with all your heart. What comes the Yetzer Hara right away to your mind? Ah, you forgot five hours ago what sin you just committed? You're pretending to be holy now? What is this? Enough with your fakeness. Enough with this hypocrisy. You think Hashem can stand hypocrites like you? Come on, we know exactly who you are. Just finish to pray and go. What do you think, that Hashem is even have patience to listen to a filthy person like you? How many times it happened to you in a bad day? You committed a bad sin, even a horrible sin. 
And now you want to pray and you say, look at me, how, how do I even dare to open my mouth? It was the first pasuk in Tfilat Shemona Esri, Hashem, Sfatai Tiftach, Ufi, Yagid Tehilatecha. Hashem, you open my lips, that my mouth should say your praises, will praise you. Right away the Satan comes to your brain inside like a little midget, standing over there with a the microphone and screaming, yeah, right, Hashem will open his mouth, your filthy mouth to praise him, he needs you to praise him doesn't have anybody else that is really righteous to praise him. Right away, it takes 90% of your heat and your energy. You lose your concentration. And you become sad. And you lost the moment. The moment that could have really been a great prayer was all gone. So the Tiferet Shlomo, Big Chachar, he said, in Gemara in Masechet Psachim, page 64, there's a rule, and ma'avirim ala mitzvot. You have a mitzvah now to do, don't say to your friend, oh, okay, you do it. I have to go, you do it. No, you run to do it. If someone does a motzi, he takes two breads, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Motzi Lechem Min Haaretz, he eats, he gives one piece to his wife, and now he wants to give you, you're the first one in the table. Some people take the bread and pass it. Manners. I should eat before I pass it to people. Maybe there's older people. Maybe the rabbi is sitting in the end of the table. Let me pass the bread. I will get the last piece. No. You got it. It's a lechem of mitzvah. There was, there was a blessing. It's mitzvah to eat bread on, on Shabbat. Eat it right away. And immediately after that, you pass. Why? And ma'avirim ala mitzvot. You don't push them. That's why in tefillin, you have to be very careful when you open the pouch, you have the tefillin of the hand and the tefillin of the head. The right order is first we put talit. So make sure the talit will be always on top, then you can pull the talit first. Because if you pull the tefillin first, now you have a big problem. You're supposed to put the talit first, but you already have the tefillin in your hand. Putting the tefillin away, it's en ma'avirim ala mitzvot. Also, when you open the zipper, you have the tefillin shel yad in one side and the tefillin of the head in one side. You have to have in mind how you put it. Because the first one you pull out is the one for the hand. If you pull the one from the head, you have a big problem now. You're going to have to put the head first. And that's not the right order. Because if you take the, you're holding the head and you put it down, put the head down and pull out the, the hand, what did you just do to the mitzvah? Threw it away. Even if it's for 10 seconds. For 10 seconds, you took a mitzvah in your hand and dropped it. It's a problem. You gotta be careful. That's why there's all these laws. The way of the Yetzirah is to cool the person when he comes to do something big. Like pray, you're full of sins. How do you even dare to show up to praise Hashem? The truth is that the worst people in the world, in the history of the world, Hashem actually listened to their prayers. The worst one. One example is Menashe, the son of Hiskiyahu. More than 60 years, he convinced the entire nation of Israel to become idol worshippers. Think about it. We have a lot of wicked people in Israeli government, in our position now, sitting, barking all day. Some of them are officially traders, help the enemies to destroy us from within. But did they convince the entire Jewish nation to worship idols for more than 60 years? They put idols everywhere? Not really. So Menashe was captured by the Goim, and the Goim decided to steam him, to make a Chinese soup out of him. Steam, not fried. Good for the diet. They put him in a big uh, kettle with boiling water. And his feet begins to burn, you know, it's metal. And he started to scream to all his idol. Buddha, Shmuda, JC, Muhammad, Fatma, Fatima, Krishna. 
דלי למה? לעצור לי נו. כנראה מי אמרתי פי אבלדר מור ניפס. No one is showed up. The God of my father, if you really there, if you save me, I'll change my way, I'll repent. Probably for the merit of his holy righteous father, the king Hizkiyahu, Hashem made a miracle and this candle from the heat started to rise. You know, like these balloons that they have. Started to rise, 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 and landed somewhere else, and Hashem Mamash made a clear miracle for him. And he repented. He kept his word. It's not like today, when a person has a court case or trial or something like this. By the way, this Ashkenazi went today to the court, and they made him sign that he will stay away from that police officer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> if it wouldn't be said, it would be the biggest joke. <laughs> like, you, if you look at him, what a nebuch, what such a nice person. <laughs> you have to be super stupid to think that this person can, can even kill a bug. <laughs> to think that he will try. But it is what it is, you know. Anyway, so this Menashe kept his word. One person, he had an appointment in Manhattan. Today, a garage collapsed in Manhattan, in downtown Manhattan. When I was on the Brooklyn Bridge, I looked down, I saw hundreds of ambulances and fire, lots of lights. From the Brooklyn Bridge on the right side, you see downstairs, so it's right by the bridge. A whole, uh, a whole floor of a garage collapsed. One person went to Manhattan, it's quarter to nine, he has a very critical meeting at nine o'clock and he's looking for parking. He said, dear God, I promise you, if you find me parking in the next five minutes, I'm going to start putting tefillin every day. I, took the, I take them out of the boy then, <laughs> clean the dust, <laughs> vacuum everything, you know, and start putting them. Not even a minute later, you know, in Manhattan to find parking is like winning the lottery. One person comes out. It's okay, I managed. <laughs> the deal is off. I managed on my own. So we laugh about this joke, but we are like that. When we have a critical moment, Hashem, I'm accepting on myself, I promise, I did, I won't. And what happened? Two days later, I don't even remember what you promised. What happened to all your vows? Now I'm good. Ah, come on, it's not fair. I was under stress. Did you see the video of the three Israelis that were caught in a flood last week? They stood on the roof of the car. The water was almost by the, by the top of the, the car. It's completely covered with floods. In the, in the desert of the south in Israel, there's a lot of floods. Many times people die there. You don't know what's going on. You drive your car on a road. The road goes down and up between two mountains. All of a sudden, it's starting to pour, in, pour rain for half an hour, 40 minutes, but heavy rain. You don't realize. From a mile away, it's going down, down. The water are accumulating, and they're starting to slide from both sides. Massive amount, which only gets more and more as the rain goes. And you drive, and all of a sudden, wow, millions of cubes of water are falling, covering the entire road. Your car shuts off. If you're lucky, you were able to get out before. Because you have a few seconds to open the door and run. If not, you, you get locked in the car, you choke. They stood on the roof, and you had to see how they were crying for their life. It gives you chills. Abba, please. One of them screamed, Abba, if you saved us from here, I will keep the breed. Meaning I will not waste seed anymore which is, you know, probably have a girlfriend or something. In the end, they, their life got saved. But the situation was really critical. Another 20, 30 minutes, they would drown. That's uh, out of nowhere. A person can die in a minute with, before even realize, oh, it's all over. So, Abotai, the... 
There is this menashe or such a rasha, and Hashem accepted his prayer. And there are Nevuzardan. You heard about Nevuzardan? He murdered 20 million people. 20 million. Like Hitler. Millions of people he murdered. Hitler, it was a lot easier for him to murder people. Bombs, tanks, airplanes, gas chambers. He can kill hundreds of people in a minute. By the time of Nevuzardan, how do you do kill people? With bone and arrow? Sword and spears, or, or, or throwing rocks from the, from the mountain on uh, two or three people. There's no other way to kill people. You have to kill them one by one. One by one. Do you know how long it takes to kill 20 million people in the primitive days? Today you press a button, 20 million people die now in a, in a nuclear attack. Today you have bombs that make people unable to breathe. You can throw one tiny bomb the size of a little suitcase carry-on in Manhattan, release it, and 10 million people that right now in Manhattan <laughs> cannot breathe, they all fall and die, and Manhattan stay as it is. No building falls, nothing, cars, everything standing. A few hours later, you can go back there and Business is back to usual. I mean, everyone is dead, but Manhattan is there. Don't even have to knock down the buildings. They have all these crazy bombs. So today you can kill 20 million people in less than a minute. In the time of Vuzardan, it's matters of years. You need million soldiers, another one, and another one, and another one. Count them until you get to 20 million. So he killed 20 million people. And what happened in the end? He did tshuva. And became a Jew. Converted. Would you join his yeshiva? Tell it to the liberal Democrats. We're going to learn Torah. Yeah? Who is the rabbi? Adolf Hitler. Ma? <laughs> yeah, he repented. He, he became a Jew. Ma? Who converted him? I want this rabbi to be on the ban. He would, they would not rest until they murder that rabbi. How did you dare to convert such such monster? They really have a point. <laughs> I hate to admit, they have a point. What normal bedding wants to convert someone who murdered 20 million people? Why did they do it? Two reasons. One, maybe they were afraid that it will kill them also. Maybe that's the reason. Or they want to teach their future to come, the power of tshuva. The power of tshuva, Hashem said, en davar haomed bifnei tshuva. Remember this sentence. En davar haomed bifnei tshuva. Nothing can resist, can stand on the way of repentance. My, what do you mean nothing? Yes, but I kill a hundred million people. You can still repent. It's hard to believe. So the power of prayers is much more than what we think. I wish we would take it more serious. So the Gemara say, and ma'avirim ala mitzvot. When a person is busy with the mitzvah of Hashem, he has to put aside all his sins. Do not let your evil inclination pushed into your mind while you're praising Hashem or requesting or making promises to become better. Do not let thoughts enter your mind about the horrible things you did before and what you're going to do tomorrow. This is one of the weapons that the Satan is using to crush people. If you're always going to think, you know, that's called being extra righteous. While he's praising Hashem, all of a sudden he remembered the horrible things he did a week ago. And immediately he becomes ashamed. I don't even want to continue my prayer. Ah, the heck with this. Close the Siddur and leave. What happened, Moshe? What am I even joking? Do you think Hashem would look at someone like me? Do you know how many thousands of emails like this I have? Tens of thousands over the years. 
What happened to you? Why are you going down? Do you really think Hashem care about someone like me? I told you once the story that I had the schut to make the biggest criminal in the history of Israel, I made him Baal Tshuva. He sent me regards on Chol HaMoed Pesach. Still remember to respect his rabbi after more than 23 years. When he came to my lecture in Brooklyn, in Avenue J, in East 14 there, after the lecture, he came to me and told me who he is. There's a magazine of the biggest criminal. He was there every week. And uh, he was telling me about his partner. He wants to put tzitzit, but I dare you. Don't dare to put tzitzit on this field. His partner. I said, why? <laughs> He said, yeah, this guy has no God, no heart, no nothing. He killed people in front of their children. You want to put tzitzit on this low life? <laughs> you have to understand. A minute ago, he was telling me that he's basically not better than this guy. But a person cannot downgrade himself. He always gives himself the benefits of the doubt. I have a reason why I'm a killer. But what reason he has? You know how it is? Like the guy who came to me and say. I hate this guy in my yeshiva. I say, why? I ask him three times not to sit on my bed. We have bunk beds in the yeshiva. My bed is on the bottom, and his friend is on the top. So when he comes, there's no chairs in the room. He sits always on my bed to speak to his friend. I ask him, I, I made the bed. I don't like people to sit on my bed. So I asked him, tell me, when you go to other people's room, do you sit on the bed there? So yes. So why you hate them for something you also do? He got stuck here. This is the way it is, Rabotai. A proud person hates proud people. Not modest women hate not modest women. Look at her, she's so cheap. <laughs> well, she's much worse. <laughs> Stupid people hate stupid people. Oof, you're so stupid. I don't have no patience for you. And it's much dumber. <laughs> people that are much worse, they hate people like themselves. So why they don't hate themselves? The Gemara says, Person is a very good lawyer for himself. I have tons of excuses. But for someone, yes, oh, he deserve to get... Uh, but what about you? Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev brings a very interesting idea. He said that the mouth that judge others and wish them bad, that mouth will determine your own judgment. For instance, if you saw someone that was caught stealing, and you say, oh, the low life, shame on you, you have yarmulke, you have a beard, and you dare to steal, what is this, you faker? And he himself also stole a few times in his life. The words that came out of his mouth against that individual are prepared on an audio clip for the day he will die. When Hashem will show him how he stole here and here and here and here, and he will ask him, what do you think we should do with you? You trick this one, you trick that customer, you stole from that guy, you stole from your landlord, or from your tenant, or from your employee, or from your partner, you know. Well, Hashem, you know, you have to understand, I was under stress, it wasn't easy, I just had a new baby, I got nervous, I wish I had more emuna. you have to understand me, I grew up poor. After he gave a great speech, you didn't even know he's such a great lawyer. Now, the audios begin to play. All done. We heard you. Clack, play. Oh, this guy Moshe is such a faker. How does he even walk with a yarmulke on the street? If I could, I would cut his beard with my own hand. And Hashem would say to you, but Moshe was a lot more poor than you. You said that I should understand you because you are poor. Look where he grew up. You didn't have mercy on him when you say that he should be this and he should be that. And you know how much stress he had? He had 13 kids. He only had two kids and two dogs. Why should I have mercy? So your own mouth bury you. 
That's why the Gemara say, Amar Rabbi Shimon, in the Pirkei Avot, Kol Yamai Chaiti Ben Achachamim, all my life I grew up with the biggest rabbis in the world around me, and what is the best advice I can give? Don't talk at all, unless it's really, really necessary. Like at work, you're in a motor vehicle, they ask you questions about your license, you have to answer. Imagine, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. <laughs> you get a license maybe for, for Iraq. <laughs> you need to talk. Some Hasidim, they're so holy, they don't want to talk to the girl in a motor vehicle or in a bank, so they go with their wives. They put their head down, they watch her, their eyes perfectly, hermetic. When I was in the airport a year ago on the way to Israel, I have a friend. He's here in Monsi. He's a very smart guy, one of the smartest guys. He used to be in a yeshiva. His father is a rabbi, he's, he's publishing a lot of books. But that guy is mamash clever. See, he has a lot of chokhmah. As we sit in the airport, waiting to get on a flight, he said to me, do me a favor. Follow this Hasid. 18 years old Hasid. 30 Hasidim standing online to get on a flight, to board. He said to me, I am following him already for half an hour. He is with a book. Now, one time he looked at anyone around, not even at men. He's watching his eyes completely, completely. It's people scream, Mr. This. Where is you? Where is that? Where is that? Uh, announcement, people make noise, you know how it is. It's trained not to get curious. Sometimes you try to watch your eyes, but you hear someone fail right away, turn around. Oh, over here, right? I sit in front of you every Tuesday. Everyone that comes into the door, <laughs> like this. If 50 people would come in, the lecture would be like CISO. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, you have to see who came in. And what happened if they would be from the back? Everyone would turn around like this. It's instinct, though. It's like instinct. That's a bad instinct. Curiosity is also instinct. Violence is also instinct. You know people that solve problems with punches? You say one thing, they warn you. You didn't get the point, boom, you're on the floor. What do you want? It's an instinct. A minute later, they regret it when the police put handcuffs on their hand. Instinct could be very dangerous. So, Abotai, when a person is doing something good, do not let the Satan break you. David Amelech writes in Tehillim, 69, ואני תפילתי לך השם את רצון. It's a moment of, uh, of uh, willing. When I pray to Hashem, that's what it means. I'm sure that that's the right moment that my prayers will get accepted. Not because I'm great and I'm perfect and I'm righteous. No, that's not what I'm claiming. Because Hashem has mercy on his people and accept the prayers of the people with mercy. Even a simple Jew can break through the heavens all the way to Kisei HaKavod. I'll give you an example. There was a big tzaddik, Rav Nachman Ordenke. Big tzaddik. And one of the main students of the Baal Shem Tov, 250 years ago, the beginning of Hasidut. Once he got married, he left his wife and moved to another city. His wife came to the rabbi, complaining about his student. Rabbi, as, as, as great as your student is, he left me alone and moved to another city. What marriage is for? The Baal Shem Tov said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Immediately he sent to call him. And he asked him, his name is Rab Nachman. What's the meaning of this behaving? 
He said, the students say, I know that once we're going to have a child, this woman is going to die in labor. And because I don't want to kill her, i rather leave her like this, alive, than to live with her and make her pregnant, knowing I'm going to cause to her death. So the Baal Shem Tov said to him, you have to at least tell her. She doesn't know why you left her. The Torah says, nekim. you have to be clean, you have to clarify your actions. If, if people suspect you, go and call the woman quickly. When she heard, she said, you should have told me. I don't care about my life. I want to give you a child. Don't worry about me dying. But Rav Nachman said to her, how am I going to manage with a baby? I mean, without you, who would raise him? I know how to nurse him and take care of him. I learn all day. The Baal Shem Tov said, don't worry, Nachman. I will raise the baby. Leave it to me. Rav Nachman went back to the house with her, and they had a boy. What was the name of the boy? Simcha. When the mother saw, first of all, she didn't die in delivery. When she saw the boy, she felt so sad that she's about to die any day, and she won't be able to raise him. So she said, Ribono Shel Olam, Master of Universe, please allow me to raise him at least until his teeth will grow. What age is that? One year, two years. One and a half. One and a half. You should be experienced, no? Yeah. One and a half. It wakes you up at night, no? Well, here you go. And Hashem listened to her request. And when the baby was two years old, his teeth grew. And she passed. And the Baal Shem Tov took the boy and raised him, like he promised. And later, 18 years or 17 years later, he married that boy to his granddaughter. And when they had a child, they called the child Nachman, on the grandfather. And who was he? Rabbi Nachman mi Breslev. Two Breslev were shot this morning. They daven every morning by sh in the neighborhood Shimon HaTzadik. Shimon HaTzadik. They are a brain and shot both of them. And was able to escape. They didn't catch him until now. But whereas they were chasing the Arab, the Arab threw the gun, the rifle. Not thinking that he has his fingerprints on it. So immediately, they f between the cameras on the streets and the fingerprints, somehow they figure out who he is. It doesn't mean they'll find him. They can go in under the ground somewhere in the Arab territories for 20 years now. There are terrorists like this that they never caught. Usually the Israeli army has good achievements, catching mm -hmm. refugees or people that escape or hide. In Israel or in the Arab territories, they're pretty good if they really want to catch someone. There's no guarantee, because obviously it's in the end of Hashem, obviously. But out of Israel, it's a different story. In Lebanon, Nasrallah is talking and talking for 20 years. What's the problem? They should have put him out of commission 20 years ago. I don't know if you know, Israel have drones, just like United States. These drones, it's like a, like a Xbox game, Atari, you know Atari game? You sit with a remote control, and you have a, a drone maybe 10 feet long and 10 feet wide with his wings. It looks like a small plane. They make it fly for hundreds of miles. He filmed the entire area, sharp pictures, much like the best lens, the best camera. They zoom in, they zoom out. They want to see a gathering of people. They zoom, they see the face of each one. They lock their face, put it in face recognition, 
And I can tell you, this one is that terrorist, this one, and these drones have missiles also. They can zoom, boom, shoot, 20 mass murderers explode to thousand pieces. And they never do it. They have this ability. You never hear that Israel sent a drone and blew up one of those mass murderers. Why? Maybe they're afraid that someone that will come instead will be worse. Better to keep this monster than a bigger monster will come. I don't know. They also have a suicide drones. Full of explosive. You make it land in their face. I always wonder. I don't get it. Now there is a mass murderer Hamas who they just shut off. 10,000 Hamas terrorists screaming dead to Israel in a funeral. You can put them all off in one second. Five drones like this, boom! 10,000 mass murderers are all dead. Why does it happen? The leaders are coward. They have no Hashem in their life. The Torah said, someone who comes to kill you, kill, kill him first. That's a mitzvah to do it. They have no Hashem, no emuna. They're afraid what the newspaper, the liberal New York Times or Yediot will write about them. Massacre, crazy, arrest him, war criminal, the court of Hague. That's what they're afraid of. Ah, that these 10,000 mass murderers in the next 20 years will kill 5,000 Israelis, guarantee. And we live in fear constantly from these monsters. Little by little we'll die. As long as we don't have to kill 10,000 of them in one shot. You have an opportunity, all this fool comes into one funeral. Boom, 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 and finish the story. No one has the guts. Putin would have done it. If Putin would be the Prime Minister of Israel, he would wait for that opportunity with no hesitation. Why? It doesn't seem that he cares so much what the world thinks about him. That's what it looks like. Anyway, Rabotai, listen to this. The, when Rav Nachman found out about the prayer of the mother after the, the, the labor, that she, with her request to Hashem, delayed what he saw, either in his Ruach HaKodesh or in a dream, he said, ay, 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 there was a moment of Ratzon by Hashem, that moment when she prayed. I wish instead of asking two more lives, she would ask to live to age 70. I'm sure Hashem would agree to that as well. Rav Steinemann, Rav Aaron Leib Steinemann, Tzadik Ador, who passed a few years ago, age I think 102 he was. He was known as, as unbelievable personality traits. He's speaking about the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 55. If you come as a guest to someone's house and they're offering you a glass of wine to do zimun, when we do Birkat Amazon, on a glass, on a cup, Kiddush cup. And they ask you to be the Mezamin. And you refuse, that's a very big mistake. Why? It shortens your life. It would make your life, God forbid, shorten. I'm not supposed to live to 90, you can die 85 or 80. What's the connection? Someone who broke someone's bones and made him paralyzed. Okay, if Hashem said, I'm taking 20 years away from your life, just like you did to that person, I understand. It's an equal punishment. Someone who refused to make bracha on a glass. No, no, give it to him. He's risking the length of his life. Can you tell me what's the logic here? No? What do you say? Amen. The answer is, Rabotai, because you miss the opportunity to bless the owner of the meal, of the house. A part of the Birkat Amazon is 
הרחמן, הוא יברך את בעל הבית, הוא בעל הסעודה הזאת, will bless the owner of the house and the owner of the meal, it's a list of blessing. So because you hurting the good of the owner of the house who just served you with a meal, it's a sign of ungratefulness, and you don't care to prevent a blessing from the, from the host, that's why you get measure for measure. The Gemara said, who am I to bless the owner of the house? I barely know how to read. I'm not even a tzaddik. I barely keep Shabbat. Because I did not give a blessing to this rabbi who owns the house, who gave me a bagel to eat, because of that I should lose few years of my life? You're giving me too much credit. For me, Rav Aaron Leif Steinemann say, that just proves to you that a blessing of the lowest person is still can be something big. Otherwise, he would not be punished like that. So that means next time when someone asks you to give him a blessing, don't make a joke out of him. <laughs> Who am I? I give you a blessing, you're embarrassing me. No, no, no. The Gemara say, לעולם אל תהיה ברכת אדיוט קלה בעיניך. Do not underestimate a blessing of an ordinary person. You do not know, maybe that day he did something huge in his life. Maybe as a person that is full of suffering and he say thank you to Hashem for all the suffering. Maybe he's not a complainer. Maybe he's not such a tzaddik, but he's giving tons of donations. Maybe he made one Jew religious, and that Jew made 5,000 other become religious. So the 5,000 goes to that guy as well. He made one, and he made 5,000. The 5,000 go to the first one, so he already has tons of merit. He looks like an ordinary businessman, an owner of a restaurant. You don't know, Rabotai. You have no idea. The Gemara say one more thing, and time is running out soon. The Gemara say in Masechet Baba Metzia, page 106, there is an owner of farms, he has a field, he hires someone to plant seeds in the field. Reuven on the land. Reuven hires Shimon to plant seeds in the field, and when the, when the, when the seed grow, he will chop them and they split it, 50-50, 60-40. So the Gemara said, Shimon never planted the seeds as a grid. Reuven is the owner of the field. He led him access to the field. He was supposed to plant seeds in the ground and he never did it. And two months later, there was a flood or a pandemic a natural disaster, a hurricane maybe. All the fields around were all damaged. Everyone who planted whatever they planted, everything got destroyed, a hurricane. Now Reuven is suing Shimon in Bedin for not keeping his end of the deal. Shimon come to Bedin and say, excuse me, your honor, he should thank me for not planting the seeds in the ground. If I would plant the seeds in the ground, which he pays for it, I do the work, but he pays for everything, and the field is his, everything will be destroyed. So, I actually saved him money. Look around, this field, that one, this one, all the fields around, all of them were damaged. Does he have a claim or no? Can he protect himself by making such a claim? Logically, it looks like I just saved you money. If I would plant everything, everything would go down to the garbage. The owner of the field should have said, no, I pray for my field. And I pray with my heart and I cry and I beg Hashem, my field will be saved from the natural disaster. Can you prove it? No. 
Can you prove otherwise? Also no. It's an equal argument. Since you didn't keep your end of the agreement, you must pay me compensation for not doing what you committed to. From here, we learn, if the law would have been that since all the fields around got damaged, most likely, beyond reasonable doubt, most likely that field would also be damaged. Therefore, I really saved you money and you cannot sue me. But by saying such a thing, we will have to tell the owner of the field, your prayers is worthless. Well, it's a natural disaster. Who are you to pray? What, the other people didn't pray? No, but I pray from a broken heart. And I pray all day. And I talk to Hashem all day. If you tell them, no, we don't accept your claims, you end half of Judaism, half of the Torah. It's similar to the story I once told you, if you remember, in Passover. <laughs> One Jew needed money for Pesach. He came to the community and everybody said, now you remember to come. Pesach is in five days. We gave all our uh, maot chitim. We gave all our money and donations. We are all now finished. We paid for our expenses. We paid for the poor. Why you only showed up now? Hey, listen, I thought I'm eating by someone and he canceled on me. I need help. We don't have. What should I do? Go to the Christians. They are loaded. <laughs> they will try to, to show that they care about you. Go. He went to the church, huge, fancy church. He walks in. Silence. No one is there. <laughs> Hello? Excuse me? Anyone? And Minyan. No one is there. Then he saw a nice chandelier with pieces inside of gold. You know, inside the chandelier with all the crystal. You have chunks of gold. A few ounces each piece. Ah, $5,000 each piece. Lefachot. He looks around. You see J.C. statue like this? <laughs> he says, close your eyes. <laughs> he gathered a ladder. He took one piece, rolled it a little bit. So hopefully they won't realize one piece is missing. The next day, the priest came. First thing he sees, one piece is missing in a chandelier. He called the king. Someone vandalized the church. It has to be a Jew. No Christian will dare to steal from the house of J.C. The king sent a soldier to the rabbi. We know one of you stole a piece of gold. We give you until Shabbat to return it. If not, all of you will have to be evicted and be thrown out of the city. You cannot stay to live here. Wow, everyone is crying. They're all nervous now. Rabbi asked everyone to come to shul tonight. Everyone. The whole town came. The rabbi say, I urge the person that took it to stand and admit and confess. If you don't have the money, we will help you. But save us a holocaust here. That guy got up. So what happened, Rabbi? Why are you so nervous? Why? Oh, you know anything about it? I took it. You took it? Since when are you allowed to steal? Rabbi, leave it to me. Give me an hour, you see, the case is going to be resolved. The rabbi says, you're so sure? Says, Absolutely. Give me an hour. He went to the church. Now it's Sunday. He comes in, all the Christians sit there. They see a Jew with a beard, comes in, yamaka. Hi, Father. Como estas? Well, hey, how are you? I am the, the Jew that took the piece of gold. Wow, everyone is ready to choke him. And the king is sitting there in a the church also. He said, you a Jew? You don't know the Ten Commandments say you should not steal? By the way, you should not steal in the Ten Commandments. It's not about object. It's not, not to kidnap people. In other places in the Torah, it says you should not steal money and objects. 
Here is lo tignor akavana nefesh, to steal a person, to kidnap a person. But that's besides the point. Oh, you don't know in the Ten Commandments it says you should not steal. Of course I know. Do you suspect me that I will steal? How exactly you, expre- you, you explain taking something without permission is not stealing? So I'll tell you what happened. I am broke. I didn't have money to feed my children. I thought you are good people. You probably will give me some charity. I came in, no one was here. But I'm, I'm nervous, it's urgent. I need food. I ask, anyone here, anyone can help me? All of a sudden, JC say, my son, why are you crying? I say, oh, JC, you know, I'm also a Jew like you. Pesach is coming in five days, I don't have money. <laughs> he said, don't worry. All you have to say is that you need money. Don't worry, I don't have cash on me right now. <laughs> But you can take one piece of gold. It's my house here. I own everything. It's on me. I want you to enjoy. I miss Passover myself since I'm hanging here for thousands of years. Enjoy Pesach. And that's what I did. Why are you blaming us, man? You can ask him. The priest called the king behind the scene. You see what this Jew is doing to us, right? If we're going to say, you expect us to believe that JC can move and talk, then people would say, what do you mean he cannot move? We thought he's watching everything. <laughs> we have to play alone. <laughs> they came in and said, wow, we are so honored. We just witnessed a miracle of our father, <laughs> JC. Everyone clap, JC, JC. And the Jews said, JC, adios. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, we laughed enough. Now let's conclude. From a happy moment to a little sad moment, the parasha spoke this Shabbat about the death of the son of Aaron, Nadav and Aviyu. We read it on Yom Kippur. We read the part that is mentioned in Acharei Mot. Here we are in Parashat Shmini. It speaks about the death of the two sons of Aaron. He had four sons. All of them should have died according to Hashem's decree after the sin of the golden calf. But Moshe prayed and prayed and prayed and half of the decree was cancelled. If that's the case, why both of them died and not Elazar and Itamar? Why Nadav and Aviyu? The Gemara give few reasons why they died. One of the reasons they say it's time for change in leadership. The two elder father and uncle, Uncle Moshe and Father Aaron, their time is past. We need fresh leadership like me and you. When will they already go to heaven that we should inherit their place? That's how you talk about your father and your uncle. One other reason, they did not want to marry any Jewish girl. Doesn't matter how righteous she is, how pretty she is. I'm sure there were very pretty girls there. And everyone was then modest. And they all were from very important family. And not one of them they wanted. Here, this one, that one. Not for me, not for me. They don't want to get married. How to believe? What normal person? You're nice looking from the royal family. You have, uh, you know, you established. You, every girl would die to marry you and they don't want to get married. What normal person doesn't want to get married? From here you see how some, the level of holiness that the people had that could live years without a woman. Today, Bachur Yeshiva, he becomes 20, 21, he's going out of his mind. That's all they talk about. Shiduch, Rabbi, Shiduch, give me bracha, Shiduch, Shiduch, Shiduch. On Shabbat, when I give the blessing in the shul to the guys who go up to the Torah, I say, Tigdal betorah, 
וביראת שמיים, פרנסה, they don't say amen. And when I say שידוך הגון במהרה, you see their body language immediately wake up, amen. <laughs> פרנסה, I can care less. Help, I can care less. תורה, I can care less. שידוך, yeah. 22, 23. going out of their mind. Such a dirty world. מה נעשה? אין דומה אחד שפתו בסלו לאחד שאין פתו בסלו. You know, the חכמים speak in a clean language. They say someone that has a bread in his basket is not like someone that does not have bread in his basket. Meaning someone that is full, not hungry, is different than someone that is hungry. The way they interact with their life, someone that has a woman and someone that does not have a woman, don't expect from them the same level. One has a peace of mind and the other one is a hungry wolf in a cage. <laughs> Suffering every moment. So, they don't want to get married. One of them, Nadav, came back in uh, reincarnation. He became Samson, the prophet. And what was his end? He ended up going with Delilah, the Goya. And she betrayed him, and the Philistines made him blind, and in the end he killed himself, committing suicide, killing 3,000 Philistines in a stadium with him, bringing the two poles down, and the whole place collapsed. And some of the Chachamim said that he, God forbid he lost his share to the world to come for being with his Goya. And there was his punishment that in his past life he refused to marry the righteous, kosher, beautiful Jewish girls. So Hashem punished him with a Goya in the end. Beautiful Goya, but she drove him crazy. He could not resist her, you know, the temptation with her and that was his end. That's why it says Shimshon Badan. Badan is from Shevet Dan. Badan is Nadav. Nun, Dalet, Bet. Bet, Dalet, Nun. It's the same letters. Different order. To hint that he's the same person in his past life. He was Nadav, the son of Aaron. So in the end, he lost from two sides. He died young. And at the same time, in his next life, he didn't fix what he did and ended up with the Goya and also died. One are the reasons, the Chachamim give few reasons why they did, that they, the Torah said that they brought fire, sacrifice that they were not supposed to without permission. Another opinion that they were drunk, because remember in the old day people didn't drink water, because water usually was dirty. You have to go to get water, to clean it. So they, what they do, they used to drink a lot of wine. But the wine was very strong, not like today. That's why the Kohanim, they're not allowed to eat before Mincha. Why? Because when you eat, you drink a lot of wine in a meal. Because you need to drink. And then you may get drunk. And you get drunk, you cannot make Yivarchecha Hashem V'yishmerecha. When you... That's why we don't do Birkat Kohanim in a Mincha. In Mincha, why in Shachrit you have Birkat Kohanim Mincha you don't have? Because the Kohanim ate lunch and they drank, they're not 100%, that's why. The wine was thick. Sometimes they mix the wine with the water, because the water is not 100%, the taste is not good. They didn't have filters like today, a Kangen water. $5,000 a platinum filter, made in Japan. What water they get from the, from, the, from the ground? They make a big hole in the ground, the water comes with a little bit brown. Like in India, that's how they drink. I had a friend, he was in India before he became a tzaddik. He told me, in India, I cannot drink water there from the faucet. Brown water coming out. You must buy bottles. But the Indians are so poor, they cannot afford the, the water in a store. So they drink this dirty water with sand. So Rabotai, the Chachamim gave a few things, few reasons why they died. How did they get burned? Fire came from heaven and burned them. In the middle of the party. 
the opening of Bet HaMikdash, everyone is happy. That's what Hashem said, Bekrovai HaKadosh. I will get sanctified with those who I love the most, my relatives. Moshe thought it's going to be him and Aaron. In the end, it was Nadav and Aviv. The main thing is, Vaidom Aaron. Aaron did not say anything. He did not say anything. He was quiet. Two of his sons just died in front of his eyes. Not one word. The Midrash asked, what, ki- what could he, be, he have said? What claim would he have? They did something wrong and Hashem killed them. Will he have any complaint? Let's see if Aaron wanted to say something. The Midrash asked. What excuse he would have? What would he say? Just emotional frustration. The, the Midrash say unbelievable answer. Let's see who is clever here. It says, the Torah has a verse, Ben Zachar, when a male boy is born, you have to circumcise him in the eighth day of his life. Not immediately. Why do you have to wait eight days? The main reason is that his mother is impure for one week. She gave birth, if it's a male, one week. Female, two weeks. So one, seven days she's impure, so her and her husband cannot enjoy. Everyone is happy, eating, dancing, and she's impure. So we give her the week to purify, and in the eighth day, when she can join the party, we do it. Don't she have to wait five more? No, but the purity, it met Shavua. So the Gemara say, everyone will be happy and the mother of the boy that should be the happiest will be impure. Remember, people live with purity and impurity back then. Every minute it was critical. What you touch, where you sit, where you walk. <laughs> Imagine if we had to live by these laws, we'll go crazy today. You cannot go here. If you go in, you can enter here, you can enter there, you can enter today. Can go to the hospital, can go into the cemetery, you can go on a flight when they take a dead body to Israel. There's a lot of limitations. But back then it was a hundred times harder. They had to go in special ramps. They may, and they sometimes have to work, go with the sack, but the impurity doesn't touch them. Ah, not easy. So Abutai, that's what Aaron could have said. What's the connection? Or you couldn't wait another, not, you could have done it later, uh, after the celebration. Oh, oh, you're good. You're really good. You have to kill them in the middle of the celebration. You couldn't wait a week. Why are you ruining it now and everyone is happy? Rabbi, I read it in Amita Miller's uh, booklet. Ah, you're smart, good. You're smart because you read Rav Victor Miller. That's already a stamp that you're smart. I love it. Every week I have to get it. This book that I have to get it. Can't live without him. Once you discover Rav Victor Miller, can't live a day without him. You have the app also. If Rav Victor Miller would ever know that he is in apps, I wonder what's his opinion about it now. People walk with their smartphone on the subway with a with the <laughs> earpiece <laughs> and listen to his divrei Torah. <laughs> you know, he was speaking slow. His style is to speak slow. He doesn't speak fast. Some speakers speak fast, like Rav Meir Eliyahu. It's like a machine gun. <laughs> what he speaks in 45 minutes, usually someone else says in two hours. So I listen to speakers. I don't have that much patience. I always put it on two times speed. All speakers. But Rav Meir Eliyahu is the only one I keep in normal speed. Because he already automatically on two times speed. <laughs> but you have a great uh, tzaddik, Talmid Chacham, Rav uh, Ben Porat. He also speaks very slow. So even on two times speed, it's still slow for me. Rav Victor Miller also spoke very, he was very calm, speaks slow, clear. So now, you have a one hour speech of him, you can finish two for the time of one. When we had the tape, there was no way. Yeah. Those tapes, I used to have his tapes many years ago. Put it in a thing, 
it still goes slow. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, with the, with the, with like in my app, you have one and a quarter, one and a half, 1.75, two. In the app, we keep upgrading the app. I hope you get the updates. So, Rabotai, Aaron could have said, for the baby, for the mother, you waited, right? That she could enjoy the party. Now, me, in the middle of things, you... Talk. The one thing I don't understand, it's written that their brothers carry their bodies from their clothes. If lightning burn a person, do you know how the body looks? A pile of ashes. You're lucky if you recognize the bones. You know the voltage of lightning? You know what lightning does? Did you ever see lightning hit metal? What happened in the area? Millions of sparks. It burns a person in less than tenth of a second to ashes. It's not a regular fire. Fire of a lightning? Thousands of thousands of voltage. If we touch 150 volt, 200 volt, we die. In Israel, 220. You touch, 10 seconds, you're dead. This is, could be 2,000, 20,000, 200,000 volt. Lightning, I don't know. You have to check on Google what's the voltage. Nothing is left from you. So how they took them out from the clothes? The answer is because they didn't get burned from a lightning or from a fire. Two lines of fire, very thin, came from heaven, entered their nostrils, and burned them from inside. They fell complete. The body was not damaged. And they picked them up from their clothes and took them out. So from the first time in history, the technology of laser was using. You know, if you ever went to a concert, I hope you didn't, but if you went to a concert of Pink Floyd, 20 something years ago, they used to have laser in the stadium. And they used to send lines from one side of the stadium all around. So you used to go all the way up to the sky. Very, very thin lines. I don't know how this machine is able to keep the line concentrate like this, it does not spread from very, very far. Those two lines went right into the nostrils of these two tzaddikim and took them to the next world. So far, about anything we spoke, any questions? I want to remind you, next week I'm flying to Israel on Sunday. And I won't be here for three weeks. So next time we will meet will be in a month. Those of you who speak Hebrew, enjoy my Hebrew lectures. We will post them Bezrat Hashem. Last thing for tonight, Hashem say to Aaron, Kach lecha egel ben bakar. Take a calf, son of a cow, and sacrifice in front of Hashem. Rashi writes, to inform Aaron that Hashem redeem, forgive the sin of the golden calf. Who organized it? Aaron. He was afraid they'll kill him like they killed his nephew Hur, the son of Miriam. And Moshe is not here. Hur is dead. They kill me and that's the end of it. No leadership. So what did he do? He was stalling. But they ran quickly and got all the jewelry. The man gave a lot of jewelry. You know a woman will give her jewelry? <laughs> She'll give her life before she gives her jewelry. <laughs> so the men were very generous. They brought the earrings. It was in style back then. All kinds of rings, this, that. They brought it and they made a golden calf. Black magic. But after all, Aaron was involved. So what happened? Hashem say, you want to serve in a temple? First you have to bring a sacrifice. What is it? Egel, a young calf. But we have a problem. The rest of the people in Israel, how they get purified from the sin of the golden calf? With a red cow. 
the ashes of the red cow, the sacrifice of the red cow, whatever they did, comes the mother and clean the waist of the son. The mother, a baby did something, the mother comes and clean it. Meaning, when we bring the red cow, is to erase the sin of the golden calf. The mother comes to erase the... Okay. But, why Aaron needs extra, extra repentance? Red cow for Aaron also. Because Aaron was different. It wasn't like the people that dance around or clap. He actually organized it. So he needs an extra repentance. But we have a rule. The Kohen cannot wear clothes made from gold. Why? Because the golden calf brings anger. So the gold will remind about that sin. So no gold clothes. You cannot blow a shofar on Rosh Hashanah that is made from the cow. The horns of the, of the bull or the cow cannot be used for shofar. You can make shofar from it, but it's not kosher. Why? Because it reminds us about the sin of the golden calf. You don't want to bring it in front of Hashem in a repentance day. Make sure you hide it. So why Aaron have to give a sacrifice of a, of a calf? A calf also reminds the calf. Do you understand the question or no? The answer is, Rabotai, because the other two, gold clothes and a shofar, remains. It doesn't get destroyed. The eagle here is sacrificed and burned. So uh, it's like we're killing the golden calf. That's why it's good. But I finish with a, a good candy that you will have good taste when you go home. There were the Gaon Rav Yudha Tzadka. Rav Yudha Tzadka was the Rosh Yeshivat Porat Yosef. Together with Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul. How lucky is the tach, Talmidim that were in Porat Yosef? They have Rav Ovadia Yosef here. Rav Tzadka, Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, Rav Ezra Atiyah. Angels, one after the other. A lot of many others. So Rabotai, <laughs> it reminds me of a story. Rav Yudha Tzadka, his uncle was a huge Iraqi Chacham. His name was Rav Tzadka Chutzin. They, unlike us, we go to the store and buy Shmura Matzah. We pay, we get good matzah, handmade, but we don't prepare it. Some Hasidim, they go Erev Chag, they pay the dollars a pound to bake few matzot, few hours before Lela Seder. Top. That's already high level. They were even better. They plant the seed in the ground, watch it, cut it, grind it, make dough, and bake the matzot. So when they cut the wheat, we have wheat. You, the last thing you want is that it's going to rain on it. If it's going to rain on it, you won't be able to use it for matzah. It can become chametz. So they put them in sack, and the sky just became very cloudy. Any minute the rain is about to start. So all of them started, please, Hashem, give us one more hour. Don't bring rain. We worked for weeks to prepare for this. No rain, no rain. <laughs> His uncle, Rav Tzatzka Chutzin, say, Hashem, if you made up your mind to bring rain, please bring pouring rain, not drizzling rain. Everybody looks at him, what you out of your mind? <laughs> We're begging for Hashem to stall the rain. And he say, if you made up your mind, make it pour. But explain, why don't, why don't we understand here? He said, I already know the nature of people. If it's going to be dripping, we're going to start an argument that will never end if the wheat is kosher or not. Yes, no, it wasn't enough. There was not enough water. The, the wheat didn't really become wet. I don't want modern orthodox. <laughs> Half and half. Forget it. That's not. You want to ruin the wheat? 
No problem. But do it, make sure it's wound. I don't want maybe yes, maybe not, because there's enough modern people that would say, oh, it's okay, it's okay. But the Eved, it's okay. Better than a machine matzah. You want to ruin it? Ruin it. Don't ruin half of it. Maybe yes, maybe not. Like this, I know there's no doubt. Okay, we tried. You're not interested. Thank you. The matzot, the wheat is all the story. So Rav Tzadka said, when we finish here, there were a few levels of sinners in the sin of the golden calf. Some people actually worshipped it. Worshipped it, bowed down to it. Some worship the golden calf only in their heart, but not on the open. They were embarrassed. They were embarrassed to, pre to, pro to admit that they actually believe in this idol. There were people who did not commit a sin, but they should have protest and rebuke the other people, and they did nothing about it. And there was one more category, which is Aaron that orchestrate everything. So remember, people who actually fully worship the golden calf, people who only worship it in their heart, but not on the open, people that were against it, but did not say anything, and Aaron that was forced to organize it for them. Those who bow down and say, this is the God of Israel, Moshe say, kill them immediately. Moshe was not politically correct liberal. <laughs> immediately they all got killed. Slaughtered with no mercy. Just like Elijah Eliyahu slaughtered the 450 fake rabbis in the Carmel Mountain, the university rabbis of those days. Right here, all the liberals from the university who bowed down to the idol of the university, the golden calf, immediately were butchered on a spot. No second chance. Idol worshippers, death penalty. Then what? It's written, Virgu ish et achiv, ve'ish et re'ehu, ve'ish et krovo. You had to kill your own brother. The liberal faker who bowed down to an idol. Go kill your own brother. Moshe, it's my brother. How can I kill my brother? Mitzvah, kill him. He's an idol worshiper. He follows Santa. I didn't ask to come to the world. That's what it says. It's a verse in the Torah, Rabotai. Don't tell me, oh, maybe Rashi holds like this, but the Rambam disagree. No. It's a verse in the Torah. Kill a man, his brother, his friend, and his relative. Ve'et krovo. No limit. Anyone who bow down one second to that idol must die. Tov. There, those who committed the sin in the heart, how are you going to know which, which one they are? They look religious from the outside. Right? How will you know? Moshe grinded the golden calf, mixed it with the water, and made, a, made everyone that is suspected drink. Just like Isha Sota, when they melt the ink into the water and she has to drink, if she cheated, her wound explodes and she died. The water revealed who actually believed in his heart in this idol. And they also died. How many were stepped to death? And how many died from drinking the water all together? 3,000 people. Big tragedy, no? Like the Twin Towers. More than 20 years we cry for it. September 11, September 11, September 11. 3,000 people die. Right here. 3,000 people die. What happened to those who did not rebuke? Did they get away with that? Absolutely not. What do they need? Those who did not stop it and did not rebuke, what did they need? The red cow. A red cow. 
And Aaron, someone who prepared an idol, could have deserved to die by Hashem, not by Sanhedrin. But because Hashem knew that he did it for the sake of heaven, he did not give him death. How is he going to be clean? By bringing the sacrifice of this calf. So what do we see, Rabotai? That even when a person actually commits a sin, there are different levels of sin. In actions, only in the mind. You know, the Torah says, When you bring Korban Ola, it's usually for sin that a person does in his mind. You bring Korban Ola, and Korban Chatat is for unintentional sin. So, so the Torah says that you slaughter both of them in the same place on a Mizbeach. That people will not know who committed a bigger sin to prevent shame except idol worshipping idol worshipping you slaughter differently why? because you want everyone to know that he's a big criminal why? because without shame it can never be erased. But this is unintentional. Like Aaron, for the sake of heaven, not because he wanted to worship an idol, Aaron. But since I was involved, he gets a big shame now. Everyone sees. Plus, he lost two sons. Two sons. Plus, he did not enter Israel. And this is a person that the Torah say that when he passed, everyone in Israel mourned 30 days is dead. Because everyone loved him. Moshe, half of the people loved him, half of the people didn't love him. Why? A rabbi that everyone loves is not kosher. A rabbi that everyone hates is not kosher. A rabbi that some people love, some people hate, is possibly that is kosher. Why? The righteous love him, makes sense. The wicked hate him, makes sense. If everyone loves him, righteous and wicked, is probably a faker. University rabbi. Kiss up to the wicked, kiss up to the righteous, send the checks and we all be happy. If everyone hates him, even the tzaddikim, the talmidei chachamim, it's probably crazy. It's not stable. Could be a danger. Everyone hates him, the wicked and the righteous. Ah. But one that has supporters and have opposers, very good. Moshe was like that. Many great chachamim were. Well, Rambam had a lot of people against him. The Rambam said to his student, that the students say, Rabbi, my heart is breaking that they burn your books and calling you an apicores. So the Rambam say to him, don't worry, I'm sure that once the pride and the ego will go away, meaning that all these wicked people will die, my books will be in every house of the nation of Israel. Now I want to remind you, 850 years ago there was no printing. Rambam had to be written with a feather, putting it in the ink. You know how many years it would take to write the whole Rambam, the Ada Chazaka? It took him 30 years to write. Well, because he had to gather all the information. But once the information is already written, to copy it probably will take a year or two. With the ink. Now, if you want to make a copy for every house in Israel, million homes, half a million homes, half a million years, how many thousands of people will have to sit and, and copy? How was he so sure that his books will be in every house? He told him the sentence that we all love so much. The truth will always prevail, will always win. Since I wrote all the truth of Hashem, 
and people oppose it, and people make fun, and people get angry, and people burn my books. Where is your emunah, he said to his student. The ego will pass, these people that bark a lot now will die, and after that the truth will always rise above everything, just like the Jews. They want to kill them, pogrom, holocaust, exile, destructions, robberies. The empire will pass and the Jews will rise. And another empire come and they will be buried and the Jews will rise. And more, and more, and more. That's why the Jews are compared to wine. Why we are compared to wine? When you take the grapes, how do you make wine? You put the grapes on the floor, you put rubber, uh, rubber uh, boots, and you depress, suppress the, the, the grapes. Boom, boom, you bang on their head. And you get the juice out of them. Destroy them, break them. And what happened in the end? When you drink it, the grape will put you down. Just like the juice. They go in, step on their head. Boom, boom, boom. You say, wait, we will see who's going to be laughing in the end. <laughs> After the wine is ready, Noah drank, slept on his bed naked. What happened? His son, Ham, the wicked Rasha, came and castrated him. He was unable to have more kids, Noah. Why? One Lechaim. One Lechaim. One Bismoishmo, Benji. One good Bismoishmo. <laughs> and the life of Noah was downgraded severely. That's the power of wine. Also, the wine, it's not like other trees. Other trees have strong stem and they stand straight, and they can resist the sun. Their grape can only climb on other pieces of wood. That's why in a vineyard, vineyard, they put uh, sticks, mm -hmm. and that's how it climbs. Without something to climb on, they have no existence. The Jews, without the rabbis of the past generations, the parents and grandparents who taught them Torah, they have nobody to count on. We don't count on the future people, we count on our past. Nation that has an history also have a future. And the Jews, because they rely on the dead, a dead stick, it's also a tree, but dead. We stick it on the ground and the living, the living uh, grape is climbing on those pieces of wood. Also, the grape cannot be mixed with any other seeds. Other fruits and uh, you can mix and create new, new uh, species, new kinds. Mm -hmm. But the grape does not accept any mixture. Ask the scientists, mix the grape with something else? Not possible. Why Jews cannot mix with other kind of people? So you see, that there's a lot of secret in this grape. That's why we do Kiddush with grape, Avdala with grape, Brit Milah with grape, wedding with grape juice, Arba Kosot Shel Pesach grapes. Why not orange juice? Why not watermelon juice? What would happen if watermelon would grow on trees? Imagine you walk underneath in a windy day. <laughs> it was a good way to stone people. A 20 pound waterman fall, fall from the top, boom, on your head. I wonder who would smash who. The head will smash the waterman on the other way around. I ask one kid, waterman grows on tree or on the ground? He didn't know. It's on tree. I say, how heavy would be to climb on a ladder to try to grab a watermelon from the tree? Imagine now, you have to stand on a ladder pool, and it's hard to rip, and by the time you go, ah, you fall and you die. <laughs> so Hashem used a lot of common sense, Baruch Hashem, melons, watermelon, the heavy stuff, the pumpkins, so the pumpkins of the Halloween, how big they are, you can break two heads with that. Imagine they grow on the trees, on the top, you have to climb, so all the heavy stuff on the ground. 
unbelievable. You throw watermelon seeds and you come a few weeks later, have thousands of watermelon in the entire place. Million dollar profit. Every watermelon they sell to Costco for five. Costco sell it now for ten. All over the United States, thousands of watermelons every day, multiplied by five dollar profits. Welcome to America. <laughs> seed, one tiny seed you throw and that's it. Let the rain come. Then they come, pick it up. So don't forget, please, next time we'll be back here, it's in four weeks. Always check the calendar. Yes. Um, about the Nebuchadnezzar became a Balejuba. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was his partner. Was the partner? <laughs> it was Yair Lapid and Bennett together. <laughs> no, go ahead. Which one of them was the friend of uh, the prophet Jeremiah? Well, the prophet was in the time that they both lived. Nebuchadnezzar spoke to the prophet. There was a, there was a, a, I don't know if it's a rumor that when they were kids, they, they grew up, is that a rumor or is there evidence? That? I don't know, I wasn't there in the same neighborhood. I lived in the other side of town. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen, Amen. Rabbi Hanani, Amen. 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 Am